It's 4 o'clock on a Friday, TGIF, and it's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! There we are, in focus. Hello, everybody. Thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Welcome to the Quarantini Happy Hour. Looks like we've got a lively crowd already. Wow. Um, hello, everybody. We've got Akira Canyon, Darren Fletcher, Bob Gunnerfeld, uh, Martin Gravel, Darren Fletcher. Did I say that already? Michael McGraw, Nancy Collell, Jesse J. Peck. And it stopped. <laughs> it just stopped. I'm sure you got, there we go, Robert Velikorse, uh, Dean Turner, Rick Cabot Podmore, Mark Reel. <laughs> Mark says, hello, Michael, happy Father's Day. You seem like a good dad. Well, it all depends on who you ask. Ask my kids. <laughs> they might disagree now. Hopefully they would agree. Spiritual, Il Rosso, Emil, K-Quest, Hello from Baltimore. Um, let's see, uh, Michael Reschke. All right, so we're all here. It's Friday. I'm gonna slurp some iced coffee to start the show. All right, sufficiently wired. Yes, Peter Rahill. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, 11th like. Smash that like button. Please smash the like button. Hello, Alex Dillon. How are you? Jam Wilage, Pete Mason, Michael McGraw. <sighs> so much better when slurping, yeah. Greg Carroza. <clears throat> man, oh man. You know what? I have a thing now. Whenever I have... Hello, Lamar Pecorino. Good to see you. Um... Dairy definitely makes me phlegmy. Not that you really needed to know that, but... Um, okay. So, continuing on from my complaint fest yesterday, <laughs> um, I've got to take some names out of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, continuing... <laughs> Try cocktail. It's Friday. I should. I just... Hi, Cass. How are you? Um, I just, alcohol doesn't agree with me. Yes, awesome, more complaints. Well, it, it's a good-natured complaint, but continuing along the thread of people not telling us about when they're getting deals. So, a little internal email that I got earlier today, <laughs> trying to get myself centered. Um, let's see, it's been a good week for taxi members. Uh, one company, oh, uh, first of all, one company signed a taxi member to a $15,000 deal this week. Yay. Um, a taxi member just got signed to a record deal. Um, a few industry luminaries have rekindled an old label that had kind of morphed into a publishing company and an artist management thing. Um, they just re refired up the label side of their company. And uh, the first signing is a taxi member. Yay! Um, another kind of music licensing company just signed, quote unquote, a bunch of taxi composers. In addition to those, uh, another music library mentioned that they plan to sign artists from the most recent batch of forwards. Uh, the aforementioned, uh, that I spoke about the other day, library signed 40 taxi composers so far. There will be many more signings, I'm sure, to a new library. <clears throat> and yet another library, I believe this one has international distribution, uh, plans to move forward to some taxi artists as a result of his recent batch. Uh, 
and I spoke, this is somebody in the staff telling me this, and I spoke to our client at blah, blah, blah this morning who is looking to sign another one of our members today. So that's all just this week alone. And how many of those members have let us know that they signed these deals? Practically or entirely none of them. <laughs> So come on, people, start reporting those deals. At least the companies are telling us, but uh, you know, and most of the time they don't just because they're so darn busy all the time. But uh, hello, Lou Lewis. Um, still lobbying for the canned applause queue to be titled applesauce. Canned applause applesauce. I, I don't understand that, Rick. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's it. Just uh, Greg Carosa. I feel bad. I have not told Taxi about the deals I've signed. Well, I know where you live, dude. <laughs> Come on, shoot us an email to any email address. Um, who should I notify? Uh, I believe you actually have my email address. If not, just send it to uh, deals at taxi.com uh, or member services at taxi.com. Um, <laughs> Cass says they have to recover from their hangovers first. Uh, all right, deals at taxi.com. Ariana posted that up for you guys. Um, oh, did I print out that other thing? Oh. I printed some other stuff out from, uh, shoot, shoot, shoot. I printed something else out on the printer and left it upstairs on the printer. Maybe I'll run up and grab that. Um, I do know that Tony Salazzo said, you should tell us uh, or tell more people about the, uh, the forward part of the taxi forum, which is forums.taxi.com. They're the very first thing you'll see on that page says forwards it's right above success stories go to forwards and you will see a lot of the people who get stuff forwarded uh, will post what they've been forwarded for and then post a link to the music that was forwarded i have heard this from literally like 99 percent of our members that are successful and sign deals all the time um, attribute a good portion of their success to the fact that they're actually listening to what gets forwarded um, and gets signed by other other members that get stuff signed and they hear it and go oh so that's why it happened this is what they're doing better than I'm doing maybe I should do that as well or differently not necessarily better um, also we have a forwards blog which I believe is blog.taxi.com slash forward or forwards Ariana if you would be so kind as to post the link for that um, we update that for every listing that's got forwards we list all the people that were forwarded and we update that very regularly so you can go check that out and also hear the stuff that got forwarded it will help you I promise um, let's see what else can I talk about today? Love the forwards blog, says Rick. Um, I just got off the phone with somebody, uh, did I say $1,500? No, $15,000. A member signed a $15,000 deal. And I actually <clears throat> wrote back to the company and said, wow. Um, was that the biggest single signing of a taxi member so far? And his response was, eh, one of the biggest. So there may be more that were even larger than that. Yep, $15,000. Um, oh, I was speaking to somebody earlier uh, today, a member that uh, I've become friendly with over the last few years. And he was asking what's going on with the rally. And I told him, uh, you know, literally now it's become a daily topic between myself and the person that sells the uh, sponsorships um, and the hotel. I usually talk to once or twice a week and we're still waiting for the, the governor and the mayor to say, yes, you know, thumbs up, you can do it. 
although obviously we would have to make a lot of changes. Uh, one thing that the uh, sponsor guy said to me is, well, yeah, of course you'd have to cut the classes down. You can't cram 100 people into a classroom, um, so you should have spillover rooms, which I don't know how we would do spillover rooms because we basically fill all of the meeting rooms uh, with classes. But if we had the rooms, which we don't, to do the spillover rooms, he's suggesting that we have video cameras in the classrooms um, and then have a, uh, like a moderator in every classroom and put um, in the spillover rooms, we should put you know like a 60 inch TV in there with a video feed from the class and then people could um, text the moderator of that class uh, their questions so that the teacher could answer them. Do you have any idea the expense and the pain in the butt that that would be? Plus the fact we just don't have the rooms to do the classes and do the spillovers. So um, <laughs> Ronald Schultz is apologizing. I did get a deal a while back through UK library. It was in the process of moving to, from Florida to Albuquerque, changing jobs. I'm embarrassed that I didn't do it guilt 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 well you can send us you know don't consider this your official notification um because um you know this thing is kind of ephemeral it's here now and then gone uh cass says uh, cigarette slash candy girls on roller skates there you go um anyway uh you know, we've talked about one thing we know we could do would be open up the fourth section of the ballroom, just to show you that we are talking about this stuff and trying to figure out a way to do it, if we get permission to do it, um, from our lovely governor and uh, mayor. Um, there is an unused section of the ballroom, section D to be specific. So we could open up the ballroom and um, have less people allowed in the ballroom but then that's a problem because you know like when i had um oh gosh what's his name from uh journey john uh why can't i think of his last name because i never remember names but you know if if we have a big featured person to kick off the rally um normally that ballroom which seats about a thousand people is just jam-packed with that and it's standing room only with you know a couple hundred people lining the walls as well jonathan kane thank you um so what do we do say i'm sorry you know uh we've reached capacity because let's say we opened up all four sections but we cut the seating down to just 500 people so that we could space the seats out for social distancing could you imagine that if you fly from you know, the East Coast, or you fly in from the UK, or you fly in from Asia somewhere, uh, you get all the way to the road rally, and you didn't get in line fast enough, and uh, you're not allowed to go see that thing. Well, you know, of course, my sponsor guy would say, well, have satellite rooms with TV monitors. <laughs> um, so that's a little clunky. Um, we did talk about, I think I've mentioned this stuff to you, talked about um, the bar would be another problem. And so many deals happen in that bar area uh, that we could take the uh, outdoor area at the end of Sponsor Row down that long hallway. There's a nice outdoor patio. We could set up a, uh, a bar out there. We could, we'd have to have monitors policing how many people are in, in each of the bars. Um, Anyway, during the course of this conversation where I was explaining all this to the member who I'm friendly with, he said, I got to let you know, I'm, I'm part of a Facebook group or something. And he said, you know, uh, there are, are five people that I know that have said, even if the rally happens this year, that they're not going to come because number one, they don't want to get on an airplane, which I personally am not that afraid of getting on airplanes. Um, you know, they're sanitizing them. You wear a mask. You can wear gloves on an airplane. I'll show you what you can wear on an airplane. You can wear that on the airplane. <laughs> Believe it or not, my wife actually wore this when she flew back to the U.S. <laughs> she wore this, a face mask and rubber gloves on the plane. <laughs> Uh, gotta love her. Anyway, um, there you go. Ray Hill says, do it at Dodger Stadium. No baseball going on. Free hot dogs and beer. 
yeah, it's not a bad idea. Um, American Ninja Obstacle Course to get in, thin out the crowd. I wouldn't get in. Definitely, I would not get in. Um, we could all wear welding masks. A virtual road rally. So, yeah, like, uh, oh, and so he said these five people, um, not only do they not want to get on airplanes, they don't want to go to an event where other people are flying in from countries all over the world and possibly bringing in coronavirus with them from Asia or Europe or wherever they come from. Um, so anyway, just letting you know, you know, it, it's, we want to do it. We're trying to do it. We're trying to work out ways to do it. We still don't even have permission to do it. Excuse me. But like I said yesterday, if we cannot do it, I am making a real promise to you right here, right now, that I will do, um, yes, a virtual road rally because I don't want to disappoint you guys. And we will do something like, uh, you know, for the amount of time, uh, maybe Thursday night, we'll have like a quarantine happy hour because Thursday night is just a hangout at the rally. I could make you all stand in line for three or four hours before you watch the Thursday night show. That would make it feel like a road rally. Um, and then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I will do um, probably like 90 minute panels or interviews, um, two or three in the morning, then we'll take a 90 minute lunch break, and then we'll do two or three more panels or interviews in the afternoon and do that for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So there you go. Um, Lou Lewis, the Zoom thing, I... <sighs> The problem with doing panels on Zoom, we use Zoom for staff meetings, and virtually every time we do it, there's always one or two people um, who are glitching out and you know all laggy and everything because the um, upload speed of their internet from their home internet is not good enough to feed Zoom well. So that's the problem. If I'm doing panels with five people, you can be pretty assured that at least one or two of those five is going to be like, and, um, you know, that kind of breaks up the rhythm of the whole thing. So at the, you know, maybe there's a way to solve that problem. I guess we could pay for everybody who's going to be a panelist to upgrade their uh, internet speed. Um, Current Rick Cabot says, I'm in the loop on a couple of threads regarding NAM, and no one knows if that will happen. Actually, I know, um, I just found out yesterday that they are going to do the NAM show in January, but it's going to be very different from other NAM shows. Um, okay. So anyway, that's the update on the rally. Um, you know what? I'm going to run upstairs and grab that thing off. Uh, I think I covered all but one of those things. Um, so I'll leave it up there and address it in another show. So what do you want to talk about today, guys? Um, yeah, I just can't imagine. You know, I honestly, I've only been thinking about having the rally and how we accommodate everybody at the hotel and still make it fruitful and good. Um, and, and, you know, I've been disappointed thinking about the fact that the bar won't be like the bar or the open mics won't be like the open mics or the eat and greet luncheons may not happen at all. Or if they do, we'd have to dramatically limit their size. Um, things like that really bum me out, but I hadn't really thought about how kind of freaked out people would be knowing that they're coming to a place with people from like, you know, 30 to 50 other countries also flying in. Um, hello, Darren Moss, how are you? What'd you have for breakfast? <laughs> um, let's be done with this insanity already and get on with the biz of music. Right, folks? Um, you're talking about the insanity about talking about the road rally or do, do you want to talk about gophers or fishing maybe? <laughs> um, stream to movie theaters in different cities. We can have a local get together while watching the rally. 
Darren's having scrambled eggs and coffee. I'm having coffee too. I'm slurping it just for that guy who hates when I slurp. Anyway, um, what if we all stay home while remotely flying drones inside the West? And there you go. Um, do you know that many years uh, before the rally kicks off Thursday night, after we get the ballroom all set up and the sound system is tweaked and the audio guys go out to dinner and the ballroom is just sitting there empty, I quietly go up to my room and grab one of my remote control airplanes and go down to the ballroom and fly it around. <laughs> it's fun. I have crashed the plane a couple of times. I actually snapped a wing off of one of my planes in there about three years ago. So let's see, is there anything else on this sheet that I haven't spoken about? How will a concert look in the future? I mean, you know, it can't stay this way forever. Um, Oh, here's something uh, that a member sent to one of my staff members. I should read this. Hey, Matt, uh, who's one of our staff members, Matt in member services. Just thought I'd pass this along. My writing partner and I just got signed with XYZ Company to a licensing deal, I guess, about five months into my taxi membership. It was on a children's song. We've written about four children's CDs and went around the country playing for young kids for a number of years, selling lots of CDs. Yay. Um, so we had many songs ready to pitch. The good thing is the guy at the company put up a portal for us and said we can upload really most anything I want. The more I upload, the better chances of getting something placed. Um, I've been in the music business for 40 years and I've written much more than children's songs, so that was great news. Um, I've had a publisher in Hong Kong for 20 years that's been great, but would like to branch out to the US. All that said, I'm really glad Taxi came along. I had just about given up on writing for anyone except my existing publisher. Um, as an old buddy once said, the only thing I get out of writing songs is that I get to write songs. Um, thanks again for all the encouragement and info that you pass along to taxi members, and that's from Danny Jones in Atlanta, Georgia. So thank you for sending that to us, Danny. And congratulations. Um, Okay, next topic, please. What do you guys want to talk about? Nancy Kalel, do we stop posting music on SoundCloud type platforms or not? The subject doesn't seem sewed up. Um, even your guests have giving, given conflicting viewpoints. Um, There are conflicting viewpoints, um, and, and it really all depends on the circumstance. There's no like yes or no answer. It depends on um, are you putting stuff up there or in other places that, you know, uh, some companies don't want stuff that's been out in the world. Um, they certainly don't want stuff if you've done a deal with one of the uh, music online music distributors that's got the little checkbox. I know I've said this a million times, but I'll say it once more. If you check that box when they ask you, would you like us to monetize your music? And you check the box, you have entered into a publishing deal or an admin deal, whatever kind of deal you've entered into it probably has relevance to any future deals that you might sign with music libraries. So you really need to read that stuff carefully and know that if you're asking one company to represent your music out there, chances are nobody else is gonna work with you because you would then have two publishers and that doesn't work. Now you could make the argument that, well, what about if it's a, a, a non-exclusive? Um, that could potentially work. Uh, I don't think people are all that careful when they read the documentation to read about exclusivity or not. Um, let's see, I'm supposed to look at Alex's question. Let me scroll up and find Alex's question. 
Um, if you get signed 50-50 when you go to BMI, does that mean that you give the publishers 50% when you report? It says the writer and publisher has to add up to 200%. I don't know. Um, honestly, I don't know because I've not done it, but I do know that you have to let them know who the writer is, who the writers, plural, are, if they're more than one, and who the publisher is. Uh, so how the splits turn out it depends on the split that you've got. Uh, you know, the publishers almost always get 100% of the publisher's share. So let's say that um, you and a co-writer did a song called Mary Had a Little Goat. Um, that was for you, Cass. <laughs> and uh, so you and the other writer are gonna split 50% of the writer's share. Um, so you would both be down as co-writers, um, presumably with equal shares. And the publisher then would have 100% of the publisher's share. That much I know I'm right about. Um, to SoundCloud or not SoundCloud, that is the question. Honestly, you guys have more experience with SoundCloud than I do because I, I do have a SoundCloud account, but it's only so that I can access certain stuff on SoundCloud. I haven't posted anything on there. Um, Darren Moss, I just want to do a shout out to screener number 19. Great feedback over many years. Um, he is an enthusiastic taxi screener. Um, he is, uh, how can I say this? He's a man about town that still goes out. I mean, I've known him since he was like probably in his early 20s, I think. Uh, I, I can remember the exact moment when he showed up to first talk to us about being a screener in taxi. I, I want to say he was like 19 or 20 years old. Um, and it's like, how much experience can you have at that age, right? And we really like to hire people that have a, a lot of experience under their belt. The thing that made him cool and viable is this is a guy that even today uh, still goes out to shows and knows all the happening bands here in L.A. and I'm sure elsewhere that are the ones that attract a gaggle of A&R people at their shows all the time. So he would go out, probably go to three or four different shows at night, um, he knew all the A&R people because he got to know them over drinks at the bar, at the, at the Roxy or the Whiskey or wherever. Um, so he was super well connected and really hip to like the up and coming band scene. So we hired him and he has been with us more on than off now since uh, 1994. Um, Yes, Matt Bantle is right. Alex Dillon, if you get signed, usually the publisher registers the track. Uh, that is true. Uh, and publishers often retitle the material you submit. In many cases, they don't register it right away. Um, first use reporting uh, replaces the registration. Uh, let's see, Greg is correct. Uh, Greg Carosa says, a 50-50 deal means the writer and publisher split all proceeds 50-50. At BMI, the writer gets 100% of the writer's share and the publisher gets 100% of the publisher's share. This adds up to 200%, which is true. And if you have a co-writer, then your 100% of the writer's share would be split presumably equally between you and the other writer. Tony Slotso says, sometimes I feel I spend too much time tweaking the timing of a vocal by maybe one thirty second of a beat because I'm chasing a feel and can't get another take. I'm guessing no one else will notice. Is it worth doing? Um, you know what? The best advice I can give you is post it uh, on the Taxi Forum where other members who have developed ears to listen for that sort of thing will give you objective and helpful feedback. Um, You know, I mean, certainly tweaking drums for to get them in the pocket and give them some feel is a worthwhile endeavor. I don't know because I've never, uh, in my day, we just got the singer to sing it until it felt right and sounded right. Um, what is number 19, screener number 19 specialty genre? He's got a few. He He's um, a bit of a 
a multi-genre screener, but I would say his core genre is hard rock. Um, very familiar. With, he's also really good at singer-songwriter stuff. Those are two that I know for sure that he's good at. Um, yep, the vocal needs to feel natural. Yeah, you know, you could tweak something trying to make it feel more natural and then you make it not feel natural. Um, okay, next subject. So funny when the when the uh, chat just stops. I don't know if nobody is saying anything or if there's some sort of glitchy thing going on at YouTube. But sometimes it just stops. Not very often. Um, nothing to report on the gopher front today. No new gopher sightings. Um, I do see a rabbit out in the backyard right now eating my lawn. Did you know that rabbit urine kills lawns? It's funny, this cute little bunny sits out in our backyard, goes to the same place every day to eat the grass, and what he doesn't kill by eating, he kills by peeing on it. Our, our gardener dude told me that. Rabbit pee, very bad. Uh, hey, Spring Level, how are you? Uh, and Spring is absolutely right. The, the Taxi Forum, it, it's like, so much better than Facebook or even Facebook groups that are specifically targeted at this kind of thing because it's like a living um, document that just gets older, wiser, and better with time, whereas social media, even Facebook groups, everything's kind of ephemeral. It's here one minute and gone the next. It's harder to find stuff. Um, Michael, what keeps me up at night about the music biz? Um, nothing about the music biz, the biz itself keeps me up at night. Um, solving problems for members. Um, I, I, I try not, although I fail, uh, I try not to read emails that I get, uh, you know, like after nine o'clock at night um, with complaints or concerns because I mean, oftentimes I have to write a response. If things make it to me, that means it's already been through at least one, if not two or three staff members. Sometimes people just go berserk. Maybe it's their nature. Uh, maybe they're just cranky people. Uh, maybe it's they're very verbose. Maybe they're a little OCD, but I, I got one the other day. It was a 500 word email. And to sit there and answer a 500 word email that's got you know 15 different points in it and four or five different questions, it takes a lot of time. So imagine getting several of those a week. Um, Spring says she's on her treadmill while she's commenting, so forgive my typos. Well, you and uh, Dean Kerpain should go head to head because he's often on his treadmill or maybe it's his bike, I'm not sure, one or the other. You guys could exercise together. Uh, okay, Mark Reel, um, shoot me your question again in a minute or so because I'm gonna answer Matt Bantle's question. Uh, Michael, could you tell us a bit more about the head screener and her background? That would be really interesting. Um, yeah, what can I tell you about her? Um, she actually is a signed artist on a real label. Um, she writes and produces her own stuff. Um, but that alone wouldn't have qualified her to become a screener uh, I shouldn't say that. We've had screeners that, you know, if they got signed to a, a record deal, they're doing something really right. So, you know, we talk to them and interview them and, and check them out. We'll go, you know, um, stalk them online and, and listen. Just because somebody's signed doesn't mean that it's, they're necessarily wonderful. Some people whose music I may not like or you may not like actually do get signed to record labels. But in her specific case, the thing that made her most interesting for us to hire her as a screener is that she worked for one of the top five people that get music placed in um, commercials, TV commercials. Um, and the person that she worked for was 
pretty intense, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but I mean intense like, man, if you could work for that person, you've got to have a lot on the ball. So she had the experience of listening tons, of, listening to tons of music for media. Basically, she was kind of the right arm and the left lung of that person for a couple of years. So she had really good um, battle-hardened training in that regard. So we brought her on as a screener, and she was a spectacularly good regular taxi screener for at least a couple of years. Um, and she just has great communication skills. She's great at analyzing music in many, many genres. She's also smart enough to know when she doesn't really know a genre well to go study it until she does understand it. If she's got to answer a member question about a genre that she might not be all that familiar with. Um, she's smart enough to know that sometimes she might have to call a screener in the room who is more expert than she is on a certain genre. So the kinds of things that um, the head screener does at Taxi could range from reading several to many emails a day where people say, I don't think the screener got this right. Could you check it out? Um, and more often than not, you know, as, not as luck would have it, but as it is, the screeners are usually right. And we don't go into things with that attitude of like the screener's always right and the member's always wrong. We take every one of those concerns seriously and try to look at it very objectively. But more often than not, the screeners were right as it happens. Um, you can find that out if you ever disagree with the screener. Post a listing, post a link to your song or instrumental on the peer to peer section of the taxi forum. And I'll bet you anything that the majority of the experienced members that respond will be very much in line with what the screener said. So a lot of her job is answering that type of stuff where she's got to go reread the, the listing, listen to the music, look at what the screener wrote, see if the screener got it right or not. And if the screener didn't get it right, she has the power to overturn the screener's decision. Um, she will bring the screener into her office and show them what they got wrong so that they don't make that mistake again. Um, she checks, uh, she's our quality control person for all the critiques that go out. Um, so yeah, just so you know, we actually um, look at every single critique. Just we want, the number one thing I think that we look for is screeners, uh, people really fear that the screeners are copying and pasting. Uh, I remember years ago, back when we used to do handwritten critiques and somebody said, oh, this screener is copying and pasting. Well, it was handwritten, but they were actually writing the same thing over and over. But if you were to try screening for four hours at taxi, you would quickly learn that many of the reasons that things don't get forwarded are the same. Those are repeat scenarios. Um, many of the mistakes that are made are repeaters. So you find yourself when you're screening, you do tend to say the same thing over and over because the same problems come up over and over. And once you kind of find your rhythm in the way to articulate it best, well, you don't want to like sit there and go, okay, now how can I say it this time for this member? Because I just said it two critiques ago to another member. What if they compare notes? Are they going to think that I'm just spitting out the same thing? Well, you probably are because it's the same problem and you've come up with a really good way to articulate what that problem is. So, you know, there've been times where people have said, you guys are copying and pasting and, and, you know, it may be close, but it's not identical, but we do watch for copying and pasting because that is an unforgivable, will get you fired immediately sin at uh, taxi. Um, okay, and so, Somebody had a question. I said, repo, oh, here it is. Uh, Mark Reel says, question, I watch the taxi TV archive shows, learning lots, I listen to them uh, when working out a track. Would the road rally have new seminars and sessions? Would I have an opportunity to ask questions? Um, yeah, I mean, typically how the road rally kind of pans out is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have classes, usually between seven and 10 classes going on, on just about every topic you can possibly imagine. Anything from creating music for media, to basic songwriting, to um, 
orchestration classes to production classes to do I need a manager class to marketing and, and media stuff for musicians. All that is going on in the classrooms on the second floor of the hotel while in the ballroom, I'm usually moderating panels that have anywhere between one person that I'm interviewing and maybe up to five or six panelists. And that could be, we typically do three or four big listening sessions in the ballroom during the course of the weekend where we have, um, we do like an instrumental music listening thing where we randomly pick music and have, let's say five music library owners sitting there and they comment on everything we play. Obviously we don't get all five of them. I, ideally, I don't get all five of them to comment because it really drags things. Oh no, now I've got two bunnies in the backyard. Uh, it goes really slowly and we don't cover enough ground when they all try to comment. So usually I try and stop them, nip it in the bud after a couple of comments, if they're good comments. Um, if I don't feel that they, you know, gave it enough depth, I may reach out to a third person and say, you know, Bobby, what do you think? Um, so yeah, listening panels in the grand ballroom, um, like the celebrity type interviews. Um, I've interviewed music attorneys. I've interviewed music publishers. I've interviewed managers. Um, I've interviewed social media people. Um, or we've done panels when I say I've interviewed, you know, it could be three or four of any of those people in a panel situation. Um, Dan Weber says, do libraries complain or praise taxi members after a submission and reaching out to them? Well, you kind of know the answer to that already, Dan, because we've had a couple of library owners on the show. Um, the short version of it is um, the praise comes in the form of, I'd like to sign this piece to our library. Um, the complaints come to me Sunday night when I get the phone call, um, Lasco. I just found somebody I love through your library, you know, through the last batch of stuff you forwarded me. And I went online, I did my due diligence and I checked out other music that they've got to see if there's any depth in their catalog, blah, 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 blah. And then I reached out to them and offered them a deal. And they said, hell no, why would I want to sign with an exclusive library when the listing had the word exclusive in it twice in all caps? Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we get complaints about. The, the most common complaint actually of late, the last few months, is they go through that whole process and then find out that the music is actually signed with the, you know, the CBD, CD Baby um, publishing deal or, you know, TuneCore, whatever. Um, Anthony says, I went to the rally last year, it was so great. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Ken Bearden wants to know, do screeners listen to each track in its entirety? Um, I will give you, uh, yeah, mostly, <laughs> and I'm not trying to hedge on that answer, but it kind of depends on what they're listening to. The in-house rule that they are taught when they first come to work and start um, learning how to be a screener at Taxi is if, if you're working on a song, um, especially if it's a song pitch for an artist that's, you know, like a big country artist or something, you've got to listen at least as far as the bridge so that you've heard all the elements of the song. Um, if they're listening to a 90 second instrumental cue, um, typically what happens, they've got the headphones on um, and currently, because people always ask, they're using uh, Audio Technica headphones. I can't remember the model number. I've got a pair floating around the house somewhere, but I think they're upstairs in my bedroom. Um, they do listen on headphones. People are like, why are they listening on headphones and not speakers? Well, because we've got several of them to maybe many of them sitting in a room together. Pretty hard to set that up with speakers. Um, and the headphones kind of make you concentrate more because it's right there and more immediate. So they will, the, the songs are served up randomly. So a screener is assigned by his or her genre um, expertise and they sit down when they come in uh, they are handed here's the listing you're working on today here's what the listing said read it let us know if you have any questions um, then they'll sit down and I would say oftentimes they listen to the refs um, because they can um, we prefer that they do 
Um, we prefer that they read the listing carefully, which, you know, obviously we want them to know what you know. They don't have any inside information unless they've been assigned to screen something for a friend of theirs in the industry that actually gave them the listing and said, yeah, I'd be more than happy to listen to anything Taxi sends me if you're the last set of ears on it. So in that case, they may have a 20 year history with that person and just have a gut feeling. They don't have actual information that you're not getting. There is none of that at Taxi, but they may have a relationship. They may be, you know, like Shirelli and I are best friends. I know what would appeal to Rob. I don't know that I could put everything about that into a listing, but if I were listening to something, um, I would know if it's gonna work for, let's say he was a music supervisor on a show and I'm familiar with that show and I know that they never use, you know, like pop music with really kind of like 13 year old tween type lyrics, um, maybe a great pop song. It may be a great pop song in all regards and does everything the listing asked it to, but if I know that that show never uses stuff with tween oriented lyrics, I might actually say to the member, this is great in all regards, but you know, this show is about people in a retirement home. They're not gonna have lyrics about, I fell in love with you when I saw you by the locker in high school. So there is a little inside baseball, but it's really infrequent and it's not like we're hiding anything from you or that it pops up often at all, but I can't say that it never does. So um, what was the question again? Because I think I've gotten off track. Um, uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Oh, about do they listen all the way through? And Jam Wilage followed up with, do they listen to submissions more than once? So this is a continuation of that answer, which is they start listening and they probably start typing something or checking boxes right away because let's say the song's intro is 35 seconds and they feel that that's too long. So they're kind of working as they're going. And I know this from my own experience back when I used to screen and many of our screeners have also confirmed this over the years to me that they will listen all the way through to get kind of the 10,000 foot view, or as I said, at least as far as the bridge when it's songs. If it's a 90 second cue, they're probably gonna listen to the whole thing because they wanna hear the build and the end, you know? Is, it, um, is there a developmental arc? Does the track feel like it's going somewhere? Um, does it have a, a stinger ending on the end? You know, they wouldn't know that unless they got all the way to the end. Now, if during the course of listening to that 90 second cue all the way through, they hear something that they think is problematic and they make a little mental note. Okay, well, I'm going to finish listening all the way through, but I'm going to go back to that section and check it out so that I can articulate, uh, get a better grasp on what it is that I need to articulate back to the member. Um, so yeah, you know, there are times where they, they might listen all the way through two or three times. Um, sometimes they will second guess themselves. They'll, their initial reaction might be, I don't know, let me go back and check it again. Um, they absolutely have our blessing, by the way, to take their headphones off. And if they see somebody else in one of the other cubicles near them, that is also expert on that genre, they're perfectly welcome and encouraged to tap that other person and say, hey man, when you're done with, with that thing you're working on now, can you come over to my cubicle for a second and listen to something? Tell me if I'm hearing this right, am I nuts, am I, you know? So there's that. Um, wow, 449 already. Man, these hours fly by. Um, let me scroll down. Yeah, we used to use some Sony headphones, I believe. Yeah, Buyer Dynamics, I'm a huge fan. Um, yeah, you can't just get, you know, people say, uh, well, can you get somebody else to listen? We know from just 28 years of experience and listening to, you know, like, 100,000 to 200,000 pieces of music in a year. We know from that vast amount of experience that 
it's exceedingly rare. I'm talking like a tenth of a percent where um, a second screener, they may hear something different than the first screener that they'd like to comment on to help you. A suggestion may be different, but will they overturn what the first screener does? Rarely. The kind of stuff that we overturn screeners on is when they meant to forward something and they type in a box, this is a great track, I'm gonna forward it. And just out of force of habit or being dopey, they, they click the return button. And the members get that, it says it, it was returned, but the screener actually typed out the word forward. We hate when that happens, but humans are humans, it does happen and it gets caught obviously by the members and we rectify those things. Um, people say, why don't you have a panel of screeners listening to my stuff. Well, uh, the screeners get paid 30 bucks an hour. So years ago, probably back around 19, no, I'm gonna say 2001, it was about a year after we moved into the new office, which I wanna say was around 2000. Um, we tried that. We came in on a Saturday and we put three screeners in the conference room and we gave them all printed out critique forms to use um, just to make things go faster so we didn't have to use the database for it. And we had them all screen the same things without knowing what the other people were writing. They were 100% in lockstep as to what would be forwarded and what would not be forwarded. Did they comment on different things that could be better or could be fixed? Yes, they did. Um, you know, members complain about that. I got a critique from screener number 19 and uh, he said that the vocals were pitchy. Um, and then two months later, excuse me, uh, I got a critique from screener number 221 and he didn't say anything about the vocals being pitchy but uh, mentioned that the drums felt stiff uh, on the same song. Well, that was one person felt that the vocals being pitchy was maybe the biggest offending problem and the next person felt that the drums might have been the biggest offending problem. Uh, I've said this a million times, if you and I, if we go to the Louvre together and we both look at the Mona Lisa and I you know, give you a little love and go, so what do you love the most about her? Um, you might say her smile. I might say the twinkle in her eye. Um, somebody else might say, I love the, the shadow. Uh, somebody else might say, I love the skin tone. Um, in the end, what it really comes down to is while everybody may have an opinion, the most important thing is, does it meet the standard of, would you walk it into the person running this listing and say, there you go, I found exactly what you're looking for and it's over the quality bar. Um, I saw an email from a member yesterday, I believe, and um, this gentleman said, and I know this guy, he's not a jerk, um, but he was frustrated. He said, you know, uh, so several industry people I know um, think this song is great, to which I really wanted to say, if they think it's that great, why haven't any of them said, can I publish it? Can I shop it? Can I manage you? Um, people are often overly kind in the industry. I see this on the panels. I've got to say, uh, if there's one thing that maybe frustrates me a little bit about the road rally, it's that when we've got the listening panels up there, there have been people, not most of them, but some of them on the panels, I think are overly kind. Maybe they don't wanna have people in the audience go, ooh, you're a jerk. Or maybe they're just trying to be encouraging and they figure, you know, why should I point something out that might embarrass this person in a ballroom with hundreds or maybe even a thousand people in it? So uh, there are times where they're overly kind and every now and then I'll say, you know, really, Jack? Um, you didn't notice blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, of course I did. Uh, and, and I can tell they look at me like, come on, Lasco, don't do that to me. Um, Greg Carosa says, you can't fall in love with your own work. If returned, listen to screeners feedback, implement it, resubmit it to a future listing. Good advice. Um, number 19 hates me but other screeners love me like I'm Dirk Diggler. <laughs> you know, personal taste, that's the real hallmark of a taxi screener. Personal taste doesn't enter into it. The, these people get hired because we think they're professional enough uh, that it's not a matter of whether they like the piece of music, it's do they think it's right for what the listing is asked for. 
Um, Let's see, Darren Moss, repost. Uh, while we're at it, I also want to thank Screener132, which is the forward that led me to a UK publisher deal late last year. Anything you can say about 132? Um, you may not remember each by number. Remember, I make my kids wear name tags to the dinner table. I have no idea who 132 is. All I can tell you is if their number is 132, because I think we're up in the... We never repeat a Screener number. Um, and I think we've got to be in the high 300s, maybe the 400s by now. So 132 has been around for a long time. You don't stick around for a long time at Taxi unless you're getting a lot of stuff right. Um, AKG 712 is pretty good. So are the Neumanns, but they come with a heavy price tag. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, there was a time where I went out back in the mid-2000s and I bought like, 10 or 20 headphones that were, I want to say like $179 a pop, maybe a little more than that. And it was heartbreaking to see how many of those disappeared over the next 90 days. I swear some of the screeners were like, you know, they come in with a backpack or sometimes they come in with a guitar case or a shopping bag. One of our screeners shows up with a shopping bag full of food all the time. And, and these expensive headphones just walked out of there, like half of them just disappeared over a relatively short amount of time. Um, but we do check out the, the headphones. Um, wow, we've only got three minutes where I'd run upstairs and, and grab them and tell you what I've got. Um, this hour went by quickly. Yes, it did. Again, happy Father's Day. Do you have plans? Yes, um, I will tell you. Um, what are we doing? Uh, my daughter and son-in-law and our granddaughter are coming over and we're going to do steaks on the grill. And we're also thinking about there is a lake not that far from where we live and we have some friends that own a pontoon boat that they never use. So we're thinking about going over and taking out their pontoon boat on the lake for a couple hours and I will ignore everybody because I'll be sitting on the back of the boat fishing because <laughs> it's my day, damn it. Um, do the screeners drink lots of coffee? Um, probably. <laughs> yeah, no snook in that lake. Uh, maybe some bass. Will I get a fishing pole as a gift? No, I, I've... I've got all the fishing tackle I need. Not a lot, but the right stuff for the kind of fishing I do. Um, wow, I'm gonna love a pontoon boat. Call them sofa boats. Yeah, I mean, I, I did have a friend back in the '60s whose parents had a pontoon boat with like twin 150s on the back end of it, some sort of special stuff on the front pontoons, and, and you could actually water ski behind that pontoon boat. Hey, JP. Uh, I'm looking to see if there's anything I need to answer before we bug out. Do we ever hear from Disney for submissions? Not that often, and here's why. Um, Disney's got record company, a record company or two. They've got a publishing company or two. They tend to really try hard to feed stuff from their own people. Generally, they sign people, not entirely, but they will sign people that they think have the potential to create a lot of music that can be used in their products, whether it could be a, you know, like a streamed kids TV show, could be uh, uh, stuff on the Disney Channel. It could be a Disney blockbuster, but they tend to use stuff that's in the family a lot. That said, we did get um, Adam Watts and Andy Dodd uh, a deal with Disney Music Publishing as a result of getting their song cut by Jesse McCartney. Um, and they both became, I'm pretty sure, multimillionaires. That's not a wild guess. I, I just don't really want to disclose. I, I know that... Yeah, their income was high. Let's just leave it at that. Um, 
And because of that Jesse McCartney thing, they got the Disney music publishing deals and their songs ended up, I think two or three songs in High School Musical 1, two or three High School Musical 2, two or three in High School Musical 3, and then more of the same in Camp Rock, one, two, and three, and many, many other Disney properties. So they tend to like really use their own people over and over and over a lot. Um, what's the funniest submission request Taxi has ever had from the industry? Honestly, I can't remember. I'm sure there have been some. All right, we are over. It's 5.01. Have a stupendous weekend, you guys. Um, and to all the dads out there, happy Father's Day. Uh, it's not a job to be taken lightly. And if you do it well, your kids grow up to be wonderful people. So hats off to you. Um, we will see you guys. Oh, uh, don't forget, if you're new and you have never subscribed our channel, now's the time to do it. Um, click the little alert bell so you get alerts when we go live. Um, give us a thumbs up if you haven't, because we liked being liked. Uh, we like being liked. Um, also, don't forget, Monday show. Don't miss this one. Oh, I do have a comment to make about it. We're going to have Steve Barden come back, and he is going to do a um, uh, like a light, breezy, uh, acoustic guitar-based instrumental cue, the kind of thing that you would probably hear on HGTV, for instance. Um, oh, by the way, if you want to really understand what electric guitar based kind of pop rock to rock cues sound like for reality TV, um, go consume a lot of episodes of a show called Hometown on HGTV. Um, they have really good rock cues and they use almost entirely like guitar driven, mostly electric, some acoustic, but mostly electric pop rock cues that I think are really good, really good in the context of reality TV. Um, as a matter of fact, twice now in the last week or so, I, I've heard um, Keith LeBrant cues in that I'm sure I've heard, you know, on a Taxi TV episode or something. Um, so yeah, Steve Barton's doing it. Some of you have asked, why don't you show the screen um, so that we can see, uh, you know, how he's laying down the tracks. It's hard to get a good shot of the screen where it's big enough that you can actually see. And is it really that interesting to see a waveform creeping along? Um, I think the words that come out of his mouth and the stuff that he's actually playing are probably the most important part. I don't know that seeing that he puts, you know, like the first acoustic on track two, the second acoustic on track three, and then pans it to the left or pans it to the right. You can get all that by what he's going to talk about. Um, I don't think that staring at, you know, at a session screen in Pro Tools, you know, and, and it's just really hard to do. Um, not so much if you're producing a show that's not going to be live. If you're doing a live show, especially with the fact that he's going to have a skinny window because it's going to be a split screen with two of us. So to have a skinny window um, that's more in the vertical plane, uh, trying to show a screen that's in the horizontal plane, not that great. Um, yeah, he does always explain stuff well anyway. He really does. And so that's it. By the way, pick, a, pick up a copy of this book. It's really, really, really good. Um, that's it. See you guys Monday for Taxi TV, 90 minutes of superb television programming. And with that, where's the band? There's the band. See you guys. Have a great weekend and a great Father's Day. There's the audience. See you soon. Bye-bye.